All right, morning. morning. Uh, I appreciate Brother Bob Delaney letting me fill in for him here this morning. And if you would, turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I'm going to read verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Okay, now if you would, would turn to Matthew chapter 24. Okay, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Okay, and one more passage of Scripture. Turn to Isaiah chapter 62. Okay, Isaiah chapter 62 and verse number 6. I have set watchmen upon thy walls, O Jerusalem, which shall never hold their peace, day nor night. Ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. <clears throat> the first passage that I read is pertaining to the rapture. It was written by the Apostle Paul, given by the Holy Spirit. The second passage was spoken by Jesus Christ, our Lord. It pertains to the second coming. Two different comings altogether. I want to title my message, The Greatest Meeting of All. The greatest meeting of all, which I believe is going to happen soon. It could happen today, Amen. or it could happen tomorrow. But I do know that, that it's going to happen soon. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this message. Lord, I believe that you're coming back for your church soon. But Lord, I'm concerned today that maybe some of your saints may not be watching, that they won't have their wedding garment on because it's, it's spotted, it's wrinkled, and it's dirty. I, I just pray that you would use this message to touch hearts, that we would be ready and watching for your return. Father, we ask this in the holy and precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> There have been many great meetings in history. I think of a man long, long ago who was living in Egypt, who was the mightiest man in all of Egypt except for Pharaoh. He stood before some nomadic tribesmen. These tribesmen stood in fear and trembling. And finally, this man could contain himself no longer. He commanded everyone to leave, except for himself and his brothers. He then revealed himself to his brothers. This man's name was Joseph. It was a meeting that changed history. I think of the meeting of Joshua as he walked near the waters of the Jordan, 
where he met a man. And Joshua fell down and worshipped and asked, Are you for us or the enemy? The angel told him to get up and said, I am of God. These meetings are staggering. But the meeting that I want to bring to you makes these meetings seem insignificant. The meeting of which I'm talking about is not commonly known in the world. It's not known in many churches. The meeting I'm talking about is going to be so gigantic, it's going to be so mind-boggling, that it's hard to use words to describe it. It's a meeting that's going to be so large that earth can't contain it or be worthy of it. It will take heaven to contain it. It will include every single child of God that has ever lived. The dead in Christ shall rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. That's the meeting of which I speak. That's the meeting that's going to take place soon. I would like to say a few words about this meeting. The word rapture is not found in the Bible. It means great ecstasy, great joy. It will be great ecstasy and great joy for those that participate in this meeting. It will be a secret meeting as far as the world is concerned. There will be no warning given of this great occasion. At this meeting, Jesus will not come back to this earth. He will only appear in the clouds. Only those who are ready to meet Him will see Him. At this meeting, He will not come with His saints. He will come for His saints. At the second coming, which is completely different than this meeting that I have just mentioned, He will not come back for His saints. He will come back with His saints. Every single child of God that has ever lived will be dressed in spotless white washed in the blood of the Lamb. At the second coming, He will set His feet upon this earth. He will fulfill the prophetic utterance of the angels when they said, This same Jesus that you have seen go away shall come back in like manner as you've seen Him go away. That promise will be fulfilled. Mark my word. The world may laugh. They may say that you Bible thumpers have been talking about that for a long time. But I'd like to say that the smirk is going to get wiped off their face because he's coming. When will this meeting take place? No one on this earth knows. Only God knows. We are to be prepared at all times. We do have signs letting us know that this meeting is near. The Apostle Paul said, In the last days perilous times shall come. I believe that we are living in perilous times now. A few years ago, individuals in places of authority made this shocking statement. They said, every child in America entering school is mentally ill. I'm talking about one of the most noted educators in the land. He said, 
Every child in America entering school at the age of five or six is mentally ill. This is the reason he said our children are mentally ill. Because they come to school with certain allegiances toward our founding fathers. In other words, he said, they believe in George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, and that's wrong. They have allegiances toward our elected officials. Every effort is being made today to demean public officials in the eyes of the people. Our children have allegiances toward their parents and a belief toward God. This educator said that it's up to the teachers to make all these sick children well by creating the international child of the future. This educator said that evidence of their intent to make converts to their religion is found in an article called A Religion for a New Age. He said, the battle for our future must be waged in our public classrooms by teachers who perceive their roles as teachers of the new faith. That new faith is a religion of humanity that recognizes and respects no God. It believes in the divinity of human beings. If you're wondering why this nation is in the shape that it's in, in 1925, the teaching of evolution started in our public school system. It's the most degrading, denigrating, dark teaching that ever fell upon the ears and minds of our children. In 1948, America, Religious instruction was restricted in our public school system. In 1962, the court banned prayer in public schools. In 1978, caroling at Christmas time was prohibited in many schools. In 1981, a cross in some public parks in this nation was declared unconstitutional. In 1982, a Baptist church called Faith Baptist Church in Louisville, Nebraska was padlocked by law enforcement officials. God forbid that this should happen. In 1983, the ACLU sued President Reagan because he declared that year is the year of the Bible. A mayor in one of our northern cities set up a nativity scene in the square in his small town. And the ACLU sued him to remove that nativity scene from the town square. Someone asked, what does the ACLU have against three wise men, Mary, Joseph, and the scene of Jesus? The mayor answered and said, I don't know, but I don't think the ACLU has three wise men or one virgin in its whole group. <laughs> I'd like to say amen to that mayor. There's a tremendous effort in this nation to replace this Bible. There's a powerful effort in this nation to take the Bible from our school children, from our homes, and from society. The ones that are doing this is the media and education. They're trying to set up a new moral code in America. This new moral code tears apart society. It causes people to lose confidence in the principles that once worked. It's one of the basic principles 
that confusion should be generated and the people should be convinced that there are no absolutes. They are trying to destroy our faith in principles, institutions, and accepted morals. Once this is accomplished, then it will be easier to transplant this fear, this confusion, and this doubt to their faith in God. until they have no faith left. The media today is the cause of this fear, this confusion, and this doubt. I believe they're trying to create atheistic socialism, where all decisions are imposed by a small elite intellectual class who do the thinking for all the people. I would like to say, Mightier men than them have tried to tear up and tear down this Bible. The hammers of opposition have beaten upon this anvil. The hammers break, but the anvil remains. Amen. When they are dead and gone and burning in hell, unless they accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, this book will still be alive because it's a word of Almighty God. God said, not one word, not one tittle, not one jot, not one sentence, not one chapter shall pass away. The modern day church seems more concerned with the here and now than they are with the there and then. Satan is trying to pull us away from the true gospel. He is trying to get us to use God to get things. He's trying to get us to use God's word to get more things, such as more money, more wealth, more prestige. Our faith is being measured by the car we drive, by the size of our bank account. God is only concerned that we have something to wear and a dwelling place. He's not too concerned about other things. Because this is not our home. We need to do, to do as that old song says. I'm getting ready to leave this old world. I'm getting ready for things of pearl. Keeping my record right. Watching both day and night. I'm getting ready to leave this world. Jesus said, with food and clothing, be content. If God happens to bless you with money... Use it to spread His gospel all over the world. We're only here for a short time. At any moment, He may interrupt your plans and say, I'm taking my children out of this world. I believe God blesses people. I believe God honors faith. But we don't want to get our eyes on this world. We don't want to get our eyes on the things of this world. A short time ago, a survey revealed that America is becoming a nation of godless people with an incredible lack of knowledge about the Bible. According to this survey, only four out of ten people know that according to the Bible that Jesus Christ delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Only 12% of the people think of themselves as highly spiritually committed. And many people feel that churches are spiritually dry. Only eight out of ten people consider themselves Christians, according to the survey. 
America is losing its fear of God. There was a time when you didn't have to lock a church. A church was respected. But today, there is no respect for the church. No respect for God. No respect for His Word. I tremble when I think about this nation that has been given so much. No nation has known revival as America has known it. But yet, what sin? Till a short time ago, our Congress said, we will give superior rights to the homosexuals. I'm not speaking against the homosexual any more than I speak against the alcoholic or the thief, or the adulterer. What angers me is that our lawmaking institutions are trying to shake a fist in the face of God and say, it's normal and therefore it's perfectly legal and right. It's sin. It's a sin against nature. It's a sin against society. It's a sin against God. America in the last few years has shaken its fist in the face of God. Instead of opening our altars to the homosexual and saying, Jesus loves you and He will save you, we have ordained them to preach. In many churches in America today, you couldn't get saved if you wanted to. In many churches in America, if you raised your hand and said, Hallelujah, they would throw you out. In some churches in America, you can drink and adulterate and fornicate and be a member in good standing. But once you get saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, and quit drinking, and quit adulterating, and quit fornicating, and you fall in love with the Bible, and you fall in love with Jesus Christ, they will throw you out. No wonder Jesus grew angry in the temple on the Sabbath day. A man with a crippled hand, and he saw Jesus. And those hypocrite Pharisees said, Don't upset our service. It's very reserved here now. Don't you break the silence. Jesus looked at them with anger. He was mad. He wasn't like some of these quiet, timid preachers today. He was mad at hell. He was mad at Satan. He was mad at at, at hypocrites. He was angry at the Pharisees. Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. And when that man stretched out his hand, the power from heaven rolled down and set him free by the power of Almighty God. If I go to a ball game, I would expect them to play ball. If I go to church, I expect them to preach by the power of Almighty God. Do we all worship the same God? Do the Jewish people worship the same God as the Christians? Is there any difference in a Catholic God or a Protestant God? Is the Muslim God the same as a Christian God? That's where the problem is. You can't worship God unless you worship Him through Jesus Christ. I don't care if every Catholic in the world hates me. I don't care if every Protestant hates me. If every Muslim hates me. If everyone in the world hates me. Because I'm here to tell you 
that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is King of Kings. Jesus Christ is our only Savior. Jesus Christ is the only way. Okay, I'd like to relate a story here to you. It's a true story. <clears throat> right after World War II, a missionary was called of God to Spain. When he went over there, they wouldn't let him build a church or buy any land. But he started preaching the gospel, and God started moving and blessing. All of a sudden, people started getting saved. This missionary noticed that his health started deteriorating. He was only 30 years old, but his health kept getting worse. Finally, another missionary by the name of Charles Greenaway told him that he needed to go back to the States. Finally and reluctantly, he agreed to go. They put him in a hospital in New York City. About a week later, this missionary called Brother Greenaway and said, They're going to open me up tomorrow, and I know what they're going to find. I meet up with cancer. I know it. He said, promise me one thing. Promise me that you will let me go back to Spain. And when I die, if Jesus doesn't desire to heal me, let me die with my people. Let me die where he called me. Let me die preaching the gospel. They operated on him the next morning. Charles Greenaway called the head surgeon and asked him what the verdict was. The surgeon said that he was eaten up with cancer. How long does he have? He has about six months. Doctor, did he mention Spain to you? Preacher, that's all he talks about is Spain. He was talking about Spain when we were getting ready to put him under. He was praying for Spain. He asked the doctor, will he have enough strength to get back? Can he make the trip? He said, preacher, I never met anyone like him. I operated on his body yesterday and cut him open, but his heart's in Spain. Preacher, take his body back where his heart is. He went back and preached until he collapsed and died. Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat fall to the ground, and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The missionaries over there said that people were getting saved by the hundreds. They're getting them ready for the meeting. I'd like to ask a question. Are you ready for the meeting? The dark clouds are on the horizon. If the trump of God would sound today, would you be ready for the meeting? When the roll is called up yonder, will you be there? All right, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I realize that parts of this message may have been a little harsh this morning, but we need to let the people know what is happening in this nation. 
We need to let them know that time is short, that they would be ready for the meeting that may take place soon, Father. Father, I pray that if there's one here today that doesn't know Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. I just pray that they would accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior before they leave here today, Father. Father, we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.